All right, so this is the third and final lecture on relativity. Um, we're going to look at a lot of mechanics in this lecture, um, but we're going to introduce uh, a couple useful tools that we have to analyze some of our space-time problems. Uh, when you worked on the last relativity lab, um, a couple new concepts that you encountered there was space-time diagrams and space-time intervals. And the space-time interval is actually a really helpful tool that we can use uh, to help solve problems in different reference frames where we don't know the interval in one, but we know the intervals in the other one. So to see what this equation is and how it works, let's go back to our light clock example. So remember the light clock example, um, the picture I show here is uh, a view in the light clock uh, from sort of the S frame, the ground frame, and watching the clock, you know, move over to the right. And uh, what we did in order to establish the Lorentz factors, we looked at like a triangle that was established by the light path here. Well, <clears throat> take out the, uh, just consider half of this path here. So the hypotenuse is going to represent... Uh, the distance that the light travels, we're just going to say that's C delta T. Uh, and then the base of this triangle is V delta T. It's the distance that the clock moves. We're not going to add the halves here because we're only going to consider half of that path there. And then, of course, the, uh, the distance that the light travels uh, up to the mirror is H. Now, <clears throat> in both reference frames, the S frame and the S prime frame, this height of the triangle is not different. Um, the light still travels as much up as it does in both frames. The difference was, of course, the horizontal motion. So because of that, we can recognize this value h as being an invariant. It doesn't matter what reference frame we're working with. If the motion is perpendicular um, to that distance, then that length is not affected. And so if we do our Pythagorean theorem on this triangle, we have that c squared delta t squared it's going to equal h squared plus v delta t squared. And that's how we get our space-time interval. If we go back to the equation for space-time interval, you can see now in this equation here, uh, we use an s instead of h, and then the delta x squared is moved to the other side, and we have this quantity here. And so, like I said, <clears throat> because delta s is an invariant, you could treat this like a conservation law where you can have the interval between two events in two different reference frames, and if you know enough information, you can solve for anything that's that's missing in there. So let's go ahead and do an example right off the bat here. All right, so in example one <clears throat> here, we have a firecracker exploding. Uh, actually, we have two firecrackers exploding, which represents our two events. Uh, the first firecracker explodes at the origin of a reference frame, which is going to be our S prime frame. Then two microseconds later, we're going to have a second firecracker go off 300 meters away, again, also in the S frame. So right there, we have the distance interval, and we have the time interval between these two events. <clears throat> now let's look at the S prime frame. We have astronauts passing in a rocket, and they measure a distance between explosions to be shorter, 200 meters, okay? And uh, according to the astronauts, we wanna know how much time elapses between the two explosions. So the 200 meters is a shorter distance. They're watching this reference frame move. So they're gonna report a, a smaller uh, length there. We actually could take the two distances here and work out a Lorenz factor and then work out what the speed of the frames are. But you don't need that. And that's what's like, the one thing that's really nice about space-time intervals is that uh, you don't necessarily need to know the gamma factor or need to know what the speed of the frames are. Um, you just need to know enough information about the intervals. So um, we are going to look for delta T prime. We know what delta X prime is. It's 200. So you can see the mathematics here. And we solve for that delta T and we get 1.86 microseconds. So they are claiming a shorter uh, length of time. All right. So that's, uh, like I said, 
an example of how we would utilize this. All right, so the space-time interval helps with exactly that, intervals. Um, of course, we can many times be interested in sort of absolute uh, positions and times. And so uh, we want to just explore how we could do that. Now, in Galilean relativity, we had what we call the Galilean transformations, which allowed us to figure out what the position is and the velocity are in different reference frames, if you know coordinates. Um, well, it stands to reason we should be able to do the same thing in Lorentz transformations. Um, Noting a couple things. One, that time is not going to be absolute here. Uh, time is going to be relative to the reference frame, so we're going to include a time coordinate as well. And, of course, because this is relativity, we'll have to incorporate the uh, Lorenz factor in our transformations. So the idea is that we have two reference frames, S frame, S prime frame, and we have an event that takes place and that event can be described with space-time coordinates. <clears throat> and the idea is we want to be able to translate between the two coordinate systems, uh, assuming we know the velocity of the reference frames relative to each other. And so to do this, it's actually not too bad. Um, in fact, they're going to look very similar to the Galilean transformations. If you look at the expressions for x prime and x, they are what the Galilean transformations are, except they're modified by a gamma factor. So um, if you look at the first expression for x prime, um, it looks very similar to what it would be. Um, we're, if we divide both sides of this by gamma here, you can see x prime over gamma, that's length contraction, right? Lorentz transformations, they look just like Galilean transformations. Uh, they're just modified by a gamma factor, which is our relativistic correction. Now, this is just one-dimensional motion, so we have our y and z coordinates to be the same. That doesn't have to be the same. You could have more complicated motion, but we're trying to keep it simple right now and just deal with one-dimensional things. Um, in the equations up here for x, uh, you could solve, for example, in um, one of the equations here, you could solve for, say, x or x prime and plug it into the other equation for x to eliminate some variables. It's a bit of algebra, but uh, when you do that, that's how you derive these time equations down here. So it's not some kind of special derivation. It's just simply taking the equations as they exist right now and just eliminating variables. So the one for t prime, we're eliminating uh, x prime here. So you could solve for x prime in one and then plug it into the other one. That's how you get your T prime. So again, a lot of algebra, but um, nothing too bad. So this is uh, this is how we're going to translate between coordinates systems. Is uh, as long as we know space time coordinates in one, we can figure out space time coordinates in another one. So let's do an example. Uh, this is going to be similar to the uh, railroad track examples that we've been doing so far. So let's look at that. All right, so we have an observer standing by the railroad tracks, sees two bolts of light and strike the ends of a 500-meter-long train simultaneously. At the end, the middle of the train passes them at a velocity of 60% the speed of light. So that observer is our S frame, what we're calling the ground frame. And we can define a coordinate system, which you'll need to do if we're dealing with coordinates. And the coordinate system will be centered on... Um, the middle of the train at that moment that the strikes happen. And so if we want to specify what the X and T coordinates are for that event, uh, event one will be on the left, event two is on the right, and uh, you can see the coordinates I've listed on the left-hand side there. Um, we want to use Lorentz transformation to find the time between the light and strikes as measured by a passenger seat in the middle of the train. Um, I mean, you could also figure out where the positions are going to be. Um, that there will be a, they will be different by a Lorenz factor because if you look at your expression here for delta, for sorry x prime, uh, the the t's are zero, and so the position of these things are, uh, you know, a bit further apart because of the gamma factor here. But we're just interested in time, 
So for point six C, the gamma factor is one point two five, and so I have my two events here: t prime one, t prime two. I plugged in my numbers, and we get that they're not simultaneous events in this reference frame. Uh, the event on the left happened later than the one on the right. Having a negative time here indicates that that event. Uh, in front uh, happened a bit earlier, and the time interval between events is 1.25 microseconds. So there was not simultaneous strikes in the moving frame. Uh, in fact, there was a 1.25 microsecond interval between those. So now if we wanted to figure out the distance between these two events, we could use our space-time interval, or we can just use the x prime equation here, and we would get... Uh, they would be the same, and it's kind of a neat little calculation that you just to verify that all these different equations kind of come to be the same thing. But um, but this is helpful when you want to just get specific times and locations for things. What's important about this, in addition to you know the normal, what's the s frame, what's the s prime frame, what's the velocity, what are the events taking place, kind of discussion that you always have to have in these problems. Um, there's one additional thing you're going to want to do here, and that's to establish a coordinate system. Um, and the idea is that the coordinate systems in the S and the S prime frame, they are lined up at T equals zero. So in, in this example here, the moment the strikes happened in the S frame, the coordinate systems were lined up. And so that allows us to now specify all these different coordinates. But you have to specify a coordinate system and origin things like that, in order for this to be meaningful. All right, so we have another example immediately here that also involves learning transformation. So in this one example, we have Mavis pilots her spaceship across a finish line moving at point 0.6c. A hooray message is sent from the back of her ship. We'll call that event two. At the instant in her reference frame that the front of her ship crosses the line, we call that event one. Um, she measures the length of her ship to be 300 meters. That would be considered the proper length because it's measured in her reference frame. And Stanley's at the finish line. Is at rest relative to it? When and where does he measure events one and two to occur? All right. So um, we're going to say that uh, Stanley here is S frame. And we're going to say that... Uh, Mavis is S prime frame. The velocity is 0.6c. Gamma factor is 1.25. Uh, the events that we know of are the ones that what Mavis reports. We're going to establish a coordinate system at the finish line. So for Mavis, um, the front of the ship is at the origin of the coordinate system. So x prime 1 is 0 and t prime 1 is 0. Um, she also reports about event 2 taking place at the back of her ship, so that would be a minus 300 meters for x prime 2, and uh, according to her, these are simultaneous events, so t equals 0 as well. Um, now, we want to know what Stanley has to say about this. Now, Stanley, because Stanley is standing at the uh, finish line, uh, would report the exact same thing as Mavis for event 1. x is 0 and t is 0. Um, same locations, same times, there's no... You know, there's no intervals there, so uh, um, so they would agree on that event. Event two, however, is different. So we want to solve for x two and t two. Uh, the Lorentz transformation equations are on the left hand side there. I plug in my numbers, and here's what we get. We get that event two actually took place. Well, Stanley says it takes place at negative three hundred seventy five meters, a bit further back, and it also took place. Uh, three-fourths of a microsecond before Mavis reports. So, you know, at first you may look at that and say, well, it's a little strange. I mean, you know, what Stanley says is that the hooray was actually given off uh, before they actually reached the finish line uh, a bit further back because the ship is less, I mean, Stanley says the ship is less than 300 meters. Right, because because uh, the proper length is 200 meters, so we, Stanley should see a shorter length. So when we look at 375 meters, we realize that uh, the ship is not at actually not at the finish line. 
So these are not simultaneous events for Stanley. In fact, if you do a little bit of the math here, what happens in three-fourths of a microsecond? Well, at that velocity, this ship's going to move 135 meters. So then the back of the ship, after that time goes by, would be at 240 meters. But guess what? 240 meters is the length contracted length of the ship. So the event two took place earlier, a little further back, and then the ship moves a little bit, and then event one takes place. And so the, the difference in the distance there that Stanley's reporting for events matches exactly what the link contraction is. So that's kind of nice to see all those, those two ideas combined together. All right, great. Let's keep going. All right, so that was for space-time coordinates, trying to uh, get a transformation system between them. Um, of course, in the Galilean transformations, we also have velocity equations for that. And so uh, we would want to have velocity equations here as well. And uh, so what we do for velocity transformation equations is we have our two coordinate systems. We recognize what our frame velocity is, which we're calling V. And then we have an object. And the object has a particular velocity in the S frame, which we call U, and a U prime velocity in the S prime frame. And we want to be able to translate between these two frames of reference to agree on these velocities. Well, if you remember back in Physics 110 when you did Galilean transformations and you started with the positions, the way you get to the velocities is take the time derivative of the position equations. Which, if I go back here, you're taking the time derivative of the x uh, equations here. You got to realize that velocity does occur in these equations in a couple different places. So um, taking the time derivative and, and cleaning things up is a little bit of an algebraic uh, nightmare. It's a, it's a bit of algebra to clean all that up. But if you do, we end up with this nice expression here for the Lorentz transformation. So having that extra time interval in the bottom there um, gives us what that relativistic correction is. Now notice these equations here. The top parts are what we expect from Galilean relativity. The bottom parts though should be viewed as the relativistic corrections. And in fact, mathematically speaking, those equations, those expressions in the bottom is what actually, at least from a mathematical standpoint, prevent the velocities from going above C. So when you add our, uh, uh, velocities up, you never actually get a value that's greater than C. In fact, these speeds sort of asymptotically approach C. And that's just the nature of these equations here, so that's nice. All right, so let's look at this first question here. Um, we have Sam flies past Earth at 0.75C. As he goes by, he fires a bullet forward at 0.75C. Susie on Earth wants to measure the speed of the bullet. What is she going to measure? All right, so Earth is S frame. Sam is S prime frame. Now, if this was Galileo answering this question, the answer, Galileo would say the answer is A. Because if you shoot an object in a moving reference frame, you're basically just adding up those velocities, so 1.5C. Einstein, if he's answering this equation, he is going to answer... B. Because yes, the velocity is going to be greater. I mean, it can't be the same. It doesn't make sense. Because uh, this object does not move at the speed of light. It's not light. So it's going to have a kick in velocity, but not as great as what Galileo would say. And obviously, there's no way this bullet is going to appear to move slower. So it's somewhere between 0.75 C and C. And if you wanted to know what that is, well, you go back to the Galilean transformation equations. So the velocity of the frame is 0.75c, and then we would say that u prime is 0.75c, and you would look for u. So that means you're using the equation on the right-hand side here to find that out. Let's do some examples now. Jump right into those examples. All right, so here we have... Um, in the first example, we have a spaceship moving away from the Earth at 0.9c, fires a robot space probe in the same direction at its motion, <clears throat> as its motion, I think that should say, um, at 0.7c relative to the spaceship. What is the probe's velocity relative to the Earth? Okay, so in all these problems, 
what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify S frame, S prime frame, your object, and then the velocities that are known. So the Earth is the S frame here. The spaceship is the S prime frame, which moves at a speed of 0.9 C. That's our V. The object, that's the thing that both reference frames are looking at, is the space probe. The velocity of the probe that are, is given to us is what the spaceship says. So that is U prime. We want to know what the Earth says. That's just U. And you can see the mathematics here. Plug it in those values. Look at this expression here, the final expression right before the answer here. 1.6 C divided by 1.63. The top is all Galileo and the bottom is all Einstein. Okay, so the top is what the Galilean transformation says. And the bottom is a relativistic correction. It's kind of nice to see that, to see exactly how the effect is going to be. So it goes faster. Right, it does go faster. Not much faster, but it goes faster. Um, same deal for example 4B. We have the same setup, so the S prime and S prime frame are the same. The object uh, is uh, the scout ship here, and the velocity that we are given is the one that's relative to the Earth. So that's U. We want to know what U prime is. So um, uh, we are we're shooting something that's faster than the spaceship, not much faster. Um, so it will eventually catch up to, but we want to know what the uh, the spaceship sees as the scout ship's catching up to it. So we have our equation for u prime. Plug in your numbers, and again, look at this last expression here. 0 0.05 c is all Galileo, and the bottom is a relativistic correction. So we end up getting a speed that's 0.345 c. All right. That's how we apply those equations there. Got another problem, looks like, right off the bat here. All right, so this is a really straightforward problem. Again, these are, I label these in-class activities because when it's not pandemic, we work out problems in class, which is it's just kind of hard to do over Zoom, so I don't do it. Um, rocket flies past the Earth at 0.9 C, that's the frame velocity. As the rocket goes by, the rocket fires a bullet in the forward direction at 0.95 C, with respect to the rocket. So that means the object's the bullet. We are given the speed relative to the rocket, so that's U prime. We need to find U. I put in my equation for U, do my math magic here. And the top part, again, I love, I, love, I like talking about the ratio like this. Uh, the top part's Galileo, and the bottom part is what Einstein says, or the Einstein correction. So Galileo says 1.85C, and then Einstein comes over and scribbles in uh, the correction, the relative is a correction. I'll divide this by 1.855. And we get a very fast 0.997C. All right. Fantastic. All right. Kind of a miscellaneous topic here before we actually get into some more mechanics is just the idea of Doppler shifts. Now, this is not exactly, as far as I'm aware, I don't really know where this is covered, if at all. I mean, I suppose it's sort of an optics or maybe somewhere in a more advanced ENM, the Doppler shifts. But regardless, I'll just talk about it as if you don't know it. Um, when you have a object that emits electromagnetic radiation, um, if the object is moving relative to the reference frame, there will be an observed change in the frequency and therefore wavelength of the light that's emitted. So in terms of reference frames here, we have an observer, that's the S frame, and then we have this source that we can just consider to be at the origin of some S prime frame that moves up with the velocity. And what happens is when light is emitted by that source, if it is, say, for example, like you see in the picture here, moving away from the observer, then it's moving in a direction that's opposite of the light, how the light's being emitted. And that has the effect to increase the wavelength of that light and thereby decrease the frequency of that. And the amount by which that happens is basically a ratio. Um, the way I specify it here is a sort of a factor that you modify uh, lambda naught with. Lambda naught being the rest wavelength of that light. And the conventions that we have here is that motion that is away is considered positive, and that's what we call a red shift, because the light becomes a longer wavelength in terms of the optical spectrum, that's a shift towards red wavelengths. 
Not to say that the object will look red or anything like that. It just means that the object has a longer wavelength than it does before. It doesn't tell you what the actual, you know, wavelength of that light is, though. I mean, um, sorry, not wavelength, but I should say color. It's not trying to suggest a red color. It's just longer wavelength, which could look red, but it also could look other colors, too. Um, so for motion that is toward the observer, uh, we call that a blue shift for the opposite reason. And uh, the convention there is to make that a negative value. So you can see the way the equation is. If u is positive, this makes the wavelength longer. And if it's negative, it makes it shorter. So that's just classic Doppler shift stuff. That's um, doesn't You don't need relative to understand that. Um, but uh, when you do consider relativity, we realize that there is an additional wavelength shift that can occur due to um, relativistic effects. So... Um, you know, if this object moves at a significant um, velocity compared to the speed of light, uh, and let's just consider this uh, uh, you know, the object moves away here, uh, then there's going to be an increase in length due from, due from classic Doppler shifts. Um, but also, uh, when you consider relativistic effect, the wavelength is, is going to end up being shorter by a factor of gamma due to relativistic effects because we're watching right, this thing move and uh, there's length contraction. So you kind of have two things going on here. You have the length contraction from the relativistic speed and you have uh, an increase in wavelength from the redshift. And if you combine the effects together, you're basically taking the equation that we have over here and you're adding a gamma factor to so take into account the length contraction. And uh, when you do that, and you, again, you clean it up algebraically, um, you end up with the equation that we have right here. And uh, this is the one for wavelength. If you want to find frequency, um, you just simply have to flip the equation. Flipping the equation puts everything in terms of frequency, and that's due to the lambda times frequency equals C relationship here. <clears throat> All right. So let's do a problem with that, actually. Um, this is a nice problem that has a lot of relevance to astronomy, which is what I like. Where is that problem? Here it is. So um, M87 is a giant elliptical galaxy um, that made the news uh, uh, two years ago or so because uh, there was a international effort to use interferometry to take the first ever image of the supermassive black hole that lies at the center of that galaxy. Uh, the significance was it was the first ever picture, really, of a black hole, um, which is not really a picture of the black hole, but it's a picture of its environment because, by definition, the black holes don't release any information, so we just see the effects around it. And so if you have not seen that, um, you could actually, if you go to my webpage, um, I have links there um, that that in my astronomy stuff that talk about that. Or you just type in M87 black hole and you'll get the picture of it. And if you are familiar with um, Veritasium, is that the right name? Veritasium on YouTube. Uh, he has a good video that goes into uh, why the picture looks the way it does. Anyway, so... Um, one of the aspects of the supermassive black hole is that it is an active black hole. It has an accretion disk, and it has bipolar jets. And one of those bipolar jets points, for the most part, towards our galaxy. Not in any harmful way, but uh, the jet is, is directed towards our line of sight. And um, the there is a particular uh, emission line that's seen and uh, that jet that has a recorded frequency of 6.66 times 10 to the 14 hertz, that would be in the UV part of the spectrum. Um, we, I know what this line is actually from though, and we've identified it to be due to a material that actually has a rest frequency of 5.55 times 10 to the 13 hertz. The fact that we can identify what the correct transition is and then measure how it's been shifted allows us to determine the speed of the relativistic jet. 
So we have things in terms of e of, of frequency here. So <clears throat> you could use lambda f equals c to turn these into a wavelength. Or, as I mentioned, you can just flip the equation and do it for frequency, which is probably easier. So that's what I did here. Um, the ratio of the observed to the rest frequency is 12. So we get 12 squared equals C minus U over C plus U. Uh, solve for U. We get a negative 143 over 145C, which is 0.986C. Now it's negative because the convention in the equations is that blue shifts, which is this is blue shifted because it's shot toward us, uh, is negative. So that's the, only, that's the only thing you should do with the negative, just interpret it as a blue shift. But that's, that's pretty simple, actually. Um, it's not a very challenging observation to make. All you have to do is just find, and it's usually like a pattern of lines. It's not one line, because how would you know about one line, right? How that shifted. Generally a pattern of lines that uh, you're, you're looking at. And then you identify in the pattern, okay, well, this particular line here should have this wavelength. And next thing you know, you got the velocity of the jet, which is kind of extraordinary. But All right, cool. Now, we can get into some mechanics now. Um, and, I mean, in mechanics, we have a lot of concepts here, right? Momentum, forces, energy, torques, and all that. I mean, you have all kinds of things once you start getting into the idea of forces and stuff like that. And um, the, probably the easiest way to approach this is to start with momentum, actually. Um, the reason why you want to start with momentum is because, well, momentum has a very simple treatment to it, which you'll see in a moment here. But uh, from momentum, we can immediately get forces because momentum is, uh, sorry, force is the rate of change in momentum. So once we develop our momentum equation, we take the time derivative of it, bam, we got our forces. If we want to get energies out of that, well, we use the, uh, you know, work kinetic energy theorem to do that. Um, you integrate force over distance, you get work, work is related to kinetic energy, and then you get all your energies. So that's kind of the approach we're going to take here. Um, now for momentum, um, the expression that we're going to have here and remember what momentum is is mass times velocity or mass times dx dt uh if we're considered relativistic ideas for momentum um there is an added gamma factor in there okay so the difference between what would be classically and what would be relativistically is just a factor of gamma like we saw in the lens transformations we throw in a factor of gamma that takes into account relativistic effects and that's exactly what's happening here. We have the same expression as we know with a factor of gamma in there. So it's gamma mv represents our momentum. So question for you here, according to the relativistic expression of momentum, if the speed of an object is doubled, the magnitude of its momentum does what? And the answer here is A. Because remember, you're increasing the velocity, but the velocity occurs twice in that equation. It's in the gamma, and there's a v in there. So... If you double V, well, you got a factor of 2 from the MV, and then gamma factor increases as well. So it's greater than a factor of 2. In fact, uh, this graph here is a nice illustration of how the momentum uh, changes with greater and greater speeds. The straight line you see here is the classical prediction for how momentum would go. But as soon as you start getting about 0.6C, we start to see a bifurcation here. Whereas the momentum, relativistically, is much, much higher than um, it is if from a classical standpoint. And in fact, um, the way you actually should interpret that is it, it's actually harder to get the object up to that speed. Having the momentum lower for a given speed means it's actually easier to get the object to that speed. The fact that the momentum shoots up here, um, the amount of energy required to get to this momentum means you had to put a lot more energy in to get up to that speed. And of course you never reach C. So the interpretation here is you'd need an infinite amount of energy to actually reach C, which of course doesn't really happen. So, all right. So let's do a problem with momentum and reference frames here. 
All right, so we have electrons in a particle accelerator reach a speed of 0.99 C. That's crazy fast. Relative to the laboratory, one collision of an electron with a target produces a muon that moves forward with a speed of 0.95 relative to the laboratory. What's the muon's momentum in the laboratory frame and in the frame of the electron beam? All right, so what, what we start off, off with is what is the S frame? It would be the laboratory. What is the S prime frame? It's the electron beam. That's pretty clear because that's what the question presents, right? What's the momentum in the laboratory frame and frame of the electron beam? So that makes it really clear. The velocity between the two is 0.999C. The muon speed that the laboratory sees, the U, is 0.95C. And we're going to have to eventually figure out what U prime is in order to figure out what the momentum is in the electron beam frame. As it stands, we can very easily get the S frames uh, or the laboratory frames momentum. It's going to be gamma M U. Now, the gamma that I'm using here is based on the muon speed. I'm not calculating the gamma for the frame velocity. This expression for P is in reference to the object. We're talking about the object's momentum, not a frame momentum, an object's momentum. So all the velocities that go into this equation have to be for the muon. So I'm not calculating a gamma for the reference frame. Calculating a gamma for the muon here. Okay, and so that's what's different about the mechanics equations. All the gamma factors before were for like coordinates, times. Now we're specifically interested in not events, in objects. And when we're dealing with objects, our gamma factors are, or we're interested in are for the objects. So 0.95C has a gamma factor of 3.2. So I put in my numbers for that and I get a 1.3 times 10 to the minus 19. Fantastic. All right. In the S prime frame, it would be P prime equals gamma prime times M U prime. Well, I got to figure out U prime. Now, this muon is moving in the same direction as the electron beam, but it's going slower. So the electron beam is going to say it probably going to say it looks like it's going backwards. Well, how fast backwards? Let's put the numbers into the equation. So I'll plug in my numbers for u and v here. We get a negative 0.962c. Negative because according to the electron beam, um, the muons are moving backwards. Uh, the gamma factor for this, there should be a little prime on here. I didn't have that. But... Uh, 3.66 is the gamma factor for this velocity here. And uh, go ahead and plug those numbers in. I got my new gamma here. Still got my muons mass here. I got my uh, U prime speed here, and we end up with a negative 2.01 to the minus 19. A little bit larger momentum. Um, and, of course, it's negative because it goes backwards. All right. Sounds good. Keep going. All right, so um, now, sort of in the interest of time and some of your sanity, um, I'm not going to walk through the full derivations of how we get to the kinetic energy, but if you're interested, you either you can, I mean, I'll just give you the procedure. You take your momentum equation, you take the time derivative of it. Realize there's two velocities in there, so it's a little complicated to do that, and that gives you forces. Um, you end up with gamma to the third power times ma for what the force is. Then we have to integrate that over a path length to get our expression for work. And, of course, work is equal to minus delta k, work kinetic energy theorem. So that's the sort of the logic behind how you get to this. The mathematics is very long, a lot of algebra, a little bit of calculus, but... Um, I can tell you what the results are because that's what we're just going to be interested in doing here. Um, what we get for our kinetic energy is a very strange expression, actually. We get a mc squared in the numerator here, and then we have a gamma here. And then this is subtracted by another mc squared. So if you write this purely in terms of gamma, we have this expression here that is uh, gamma minus 1 
times mc squared. Now, mc squared, when you look at the units of this, which would be kilometers, meters per second, well, meter squared, second squared. That's the units of energy. So this mc squared is what we refer to as res energy, which is, uh, which is you know, strange. Well, you know, this, this expression here, mc squared, is strange that it shows up in this thing. So what happens is, and you can see how this is going to have to work here, um, is say if the particle doesn't move at all. Well, the particle doesn't move, um, then your gamma factor is 1, and the 1 subtract down, you get a 0 here, as you would expect. Um, but if you do have a gamma factor, well, you get some expression for the first term, but then you have to subtract off this mc squared. So it's like we're trying to get a quantity for, well, we're trying to figure out our kinetic energy, and so we have to calculate a quantity and then subtract out another number from it. Again, very odd why we have to do this. Well, um, very similar to the, um, very similar to the uh, momentum relationship um, for a given particular value of velocity, uh, the kinetic energy relativistically is much larger than it would, it would be if we had Galileo or, or Newton talking about things. Again, it's because of the relativistic corrections. And uh, again, the interpretation should be here. It's actually harder to get up to these energies and speeds than it was classically. Classically, you have just a parabola, right? One half mv squared, right? Um, but the expression we have for kinetic energy has a, a, a sort of a steeper increase in the curvature. And it's also asymptotic with C. So according to the relativist expression for kinetic energy, the kinetic energy of an object of mass and movement of speed V would be, the answer is C. All right. So it's true for really all of these concepts of momentum, energy, things like that that the relativistic values are greater than they are classically. All right, this question here, we have an electron with a rest energy of 0.5 MeV. Um, that may be a strange unit to you if you've not seen that before. Uh, EV is called an electron volt. It's the energy gained by an electron as it travels through one volt of electric potential. It has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So this is mega electron volt. So it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus, what, 13 joules then? And it would be half that. It just seems like a strange unit, but it's just, uh, we, you know, when we're dealing with particles, they typically have pretty small energies. So we have this alternative unit, which, by the way, you're going to see a lot of this unit um, as we start moving on and get into more modern physics stuff. Anyway. Uh, the gamma factor for 0.968c <clears throat> is 4. And so what would the kinetic energy of this particle be? Well, the expression is gamma minus 1 mc squared. The mc squared is the rest energy. That's 0.5 MeV. So the gamma minus 1 would be 3 and then times the rest energy. So that would be equivalent with B. B is the correct answer here. Okay. So go back to that equation here. As I mentioned... Uh, so you have this strange like factor that's subtracted off from it. So if you actually move that minus mc squared to the other side of the equation, we end up with a k plus mc squared. And we identify that actually as being a total particle energy. Okay, I mean, having a kinetic energy plus another energy term, we can specify that as the total energy of a, and we call this for a free particle. Um, the use of the word free particle is just indicating that there are no potentials to include in the energy equation here. Um, if the particle obviously is bound by any potentials, whether it's gravity, electromagnetism, whatever, you have to include that in here. But this is for free particles. And so, you know, cleaning this up here, if we put in our expression for this stuff, uh, adding the mc squared just gives you an mc squared <clears throat> over the square root thing, the lens factor. And so that energy is just gamma mc. So specifying the total energy of the particle is given by this thing right here, which means another implication of this is if the particle does not move, 
right? The kinetic energy is zero, so the particle still has energy. It has this rest energy, the mc squared that goes with it. Uh, in the expression for gamma here, if you have a speed of zero, gamma is one. So you still have an mc squared here, which is kind of wild. It's a wild prediction of relativity that we can still specify an energy that a particle has, even though it has no motion and it's not bound by any potentials. So that's, that's again, that's also pretty wild. Um, what we could do with this equation here, um, so if you take the E equals gamma mc squared, and you take the square root, not the square root, sorry, if you square both sides of the equation, and again, you want to go through a bunch of algebraic gymnastics here, at some point, um, you can uh, change one of the terms to represent momentum. And when that's done, you can create a relationship between energy and momentum here, which is this expression at the bottom here. The total energy is given by rest energy squared and P times C, which is again, a type of energy. Now, this is really interesting because this is the total energy of things, things. Um, okay, and what do I mean by things? Well, say we're talking about a particle, like a proton, right? That's moving at some velocity. Well, there is a term at the start that represents the rest energy. Just by it existing and having mass, there's energy. And then we have its momentum in here. Of course, that's relativistic momentum, right? So, two combined together, together to give us what the total energy of the particle is. If we are, have something like a photon, right? Packet of light. Well, they don't have mass. So the first term is gone. There's no rest energy. And there's just the second term. So we end up having E equals PC, which represents the energy of that photon, which is strange because it has momentum in here. So photons have momentum. Uh, it's something that's been known for a while, but this actually expresses what the momentum of that particle is, uh, what that photon is. And this is one of many different things we're going to start to see in here that suggests this light particle duality that all things have, or we're actually we refer to as a wave particle duality, that light is being a wave, normally understood as a wave, have particle-like properties to it, like has momentum. And then as we're going to see later, we have particles like electrons that have wave-like properties to it. For example, we you saw diffraction and interference stuff back in optics. Well, it turns out it doesn't just work for light. Electrons can do it. You can shoot electrons through slits, and guess what? You get interference patterns. All right, it's getting weird. All right, it's getting weird. All right, so let's try to apply some of this mass energy equivalent stuff. Um, in this particular example here, we have particles here. Well, let's just say they have equivalent masses and they smash together and they stick. So it's an inelastic collision. And, uh, you know, if we look at the particles to begin with, then, well, we can specify what their energies are. Their energies are the kinetic energies of the particles plus their rest energies. And so that's this expression E initial here, the rest energies plus the kinetic energies. They smash together, right? They're, they combine into a single mass, but since they were moving at the same speeds to begin with, when they collide, they come to a rest. And so if we look at what that thing is, that would just be the rest energy of the two particles now, 2mc squared. Well, um, Energy conservation says that these two things are equal, so we set them equal, and we end up with this expression in the middle here. Dividing things by c squared, we see that the mass of the particle, the now combined particle, is not the same as the sum of the masses before. In fact, the prediction here is that the mass of the this combined particle here after the collision is greater. Greater. It's a larger mass than it had beforehand. 
And where does that mass come from? It comes from the kinetic energy being converted into mass, the mass energy equivalence here. Now, 2k over c squared is what the additional mass value would be. But what's c, right? c is 3 times 10 to the 8. And you square that and you get 9 times 10 to the 16. That's a big number in the denominator there. So in order for this to be a, a significant factor, you have to have your value for kinetic energy pretty darn high, like really high. Um, you just smash two balls of clay together at normal speeds. This factor here is tiny, insignificant. But when you start getting to relativistic speeds and relativistic energies, then we start to see these effects take place. Interesting. All right, so this is uh, something that's commonly done in particle accelerators. Um, we have these high energy electrons being shot at some kind of material here. So when it's shot at this material, what's going to happen is you're going to have a huge amount of kinetic energy being done here. And when that hits, that energy has to go into something. And when your energies are significantly high enough, that can actually result in the creation of new particles. And so we see here, in, uh, after that collides, we see a bunch of electrons and positrons, which is one really common way that mass and energy get converted between each other in these kind of particle accelerators. And so we see that kind of stuff taking place here. And you say, well, where do these come from? Well, it's the energy from the high-speed electron being converted into mass as this thing comes to a rest. So, and that's how a lot of particle accelerators operate. Um, they take these particles and they increase them to ridiculously high speeds. And when the collisions take place, that energy that's you know, reduced from the equations, if the energy is sufficiently high enough, can result in the creation of new particles. And so uh, what they do right now, like in CERN, is they just, on the LHC, they just keep up in the energies of these relativistic particles to reach higher and higher energies so we can see new particles being created. And so the standard model of physics is just makes lots of predictions about the kind of energies these new particles might have. They up the speed of these particles so that the collisions should result in those kind of energies being emitted, and we just start to look for these new particles here. And a lot of times we're very successful. That was sort of the story with the Higgs boson being discovered. It's a massive particle. It requires a very high energy collision. It was a prediction. They start smashing things together, and, they look, and then next thing you know, you find a Higgs boson. So that's sort of the idea behind that stuff. So let's look at an example of this. All right, so we got two protons here, and they're moving in opposite directions, and they're going to smash together. And after they smash together, um, their velocity is going to go to zero. And um, if, and again, this is the example I was, you know, kind of talking about for the, for the particle accelerators. Given the right speed, when these things smash, the resultant energy, if it matches the rest energy of, a, of some kind of subatomic particle, then it's possible that you create that particle. So um, after the collision takes place, um, we have a neutral pion that gets created. And uh, we're given the mass of that pion to be 2.4 to the center of the minus 28. And... The question we have ourselves here is if we want to create these pions, what kind of energy do the protons have to have initially so that when they collide, there's enough energy remaining to create this mass? So the before picture is the two protons flying towards each other. The total energies of these are going to be, again, the combined kinetic and rest energies, which is given by gamma mc squared. Uh, we'll put a factor of two here because we have two protons. They smash together. And so what ought to be the remaining energy would be the rest mass of the protons plus the rest mass of this newly created pion. So energy conservation says these two equations are going to be equal to each other. We set them equal to each other. Solve for the gamma factor. We get 1.072. Solve for the velocity. We get 0.36c. So shooting protons together, shooting them at each other with velocities 0.3c as seen from the ground frame. Um, can result and does in experiments result in the creation of pions. So that's pretty cool.
All right. Um, do I have another question here? I think I do. I got another question here. All right. So this is a real simple one. We were just trying to calculate <clears throat> um, energies and kinetic energies and for non-relativistic and relativistic things. So, I mean, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the mathematics here, but um, if you have a non-relativistic object like this ball with a speed of 100 meters per second, you could work out the total energy of that thing, which is 9 times 10 to the 15. And the kinetic energy is given by the classical 1 half mv squared. And that's 500 joules. As you can see, the object is non-relativistic. And you can tell that because there's a massive difference between the kinetic energy and the rest energy of the particle. So we get to the relativistic electron here. Moving at 0.999C is a gamma factor of 22.4. So if we need to work out what um, the rest energy of that particle is, um, that's going to be 8.2 times to the minus 14. And we work at the kinetic energy. And we can see that's a big difference here. Um, gamma minus 1, right? So that's going to be 21.4 times the rest energy is 1.75 times to the minus 12. Okay, big difference here. A non-relativistic particle has an extremely small, almost a trillionth of the energy of its rest mass, whereas the electron moving at that speed has a lot more energy, almost, almost two orders of magnitude more energy than its rest energy. And when you see situations like that, then we realize we're dealing with a relativistic particle. Okay. All right, so we're just going to wrap this up with a few more statements about energy equivalence here. Um, the, the slide here is just kind of what I've been explaining so far here, where um, particle accelerators experiments look at energies before and after and look for mass being created when we do energy conservations. Um, so, you know, you, it's not just particles being created, it's also light being created. Um, and the example here, this is a very common energy mass equivalence phenomenon here, is having electrons and positrons collide. And when they do, their rest masses are converted into photon energies. And, um, you can predict the kind of photons that come out of these collisions uh, by looking at the rest masses and equating that to what the energy of a photon is. The energy of that photon, well, we're going to get into more of that in the next in the coming up stuff here. But you can go in opposite directions here um, with the energy conservation. Um, you can have high energy photons collide with things and that can result in the creation of electron-positron pairs. So you can go back and forth with these two ideas. Um, the energies of these photons, are, as you can imagine, they're very high. They're gamma ray type energies. And in fact, that's the next lecture we have. We're going to start digging into properties of light more and start looking at the kind of energies involved there. And we'll return to particle-antiparticle annihilation problems so we can see how that's done. All right, so question for you here. Um, we have... a uh, the proton's rest energy is uh, 938 mega electron volts. We're going to look at a proton and an antiproton, which is identical to the proton in mass, but opposite in charge, obviously. We're going to get these things to collide. Um, um, and with a speed that's not incredibly high, because um, if we're going to do a simple energy conservation here, we want to just have a speed that's slow enough that the, the, the rest mass is the more important factor here. So anyway, they collide, and we have different scenarios here. And what are the possible scenarios? Okay, so the answer here is actually D. Um, not only do we have to conserve energy, uh, but we also need to conserve momentum as well. So the total momentum of the initial collision here is zero. Particles are moving in opposite directions, so momentum zero. So if we look at A, A works because the amount of energy beforehand is the same as energy afterwards. They're just two high energy photons traveling in different directions and the momentum is still zero. B doesn't work because the momentum is not conserved. We didn't have Y direction momentum. Now we do. That's a problem. C does work because even though you see Y momentum in the, in the uh, reaction here, 
the y momentum upward, the components upward, cancel out the ones downward. So this is okay to have because you still end up with the same momentum uh, afterwards. Nothing in y, and then you result. The result here is just something in, in the x direction here. Uh, energy is conserved, obviously, as well there. So interesting because these collisions can result in two different phenomena taking place, and uh, they're both observed. Um, any mathematically and physically possible interaction that can take place, as long as you're concerned momentum and energy, are, are possible. So it's not like we see one or the other. In fact, it's one of uh, kind of a mystery, I guess you would say, the unpredictability of these things, this is apparently a random process. Which one will it choose when the collision happens? Well, they both are valid. So, and it's not entirely known why one particular reaction is occurs and not another one. So, all right, last up uh, applications here is to look at nuclear fission and fusion. Um, this is another example where you have the mass energy equivalence at play here. For nuclear fission, we have neutrons colliding with large particles to break them into pieces. And those pieces, uh, when they break apart, they don't just break into smaller particles. There is generally a large release of energy in the process that's in the form of kinetic energy, which very rapidly gets converted into thermal energy. Um, and it's due to the mass energy equivalence. When the, say, uranium in this example here breaks apart, um, some of the mass is converted into energy. And um, and in the case of, you know, fission reactions, this is, you know, a lot of ways that bombs are made where having these neutrons collide creates this sort of runaway effect, a snowball effect, because when these fission things take place, they produce extra neutrons. So if you have a significant amount of uranium around, the other uranium atoms get hit with neutrons and they break apart and then again you have this runaway effect and a huge amount of energy release. Um, for uh, fusion reactions it's the opposite thing you're building nuclei that have breaking it apart and the reaction that you see here now I'm not interested in you know the details behind these reactions I'm just sort of communicating to you you know how the mass energy uh, equivalence works in these problems, but this is uh, the simplest fusion reaction that we can talk about. And uh, this occurs in every single star. It occurs in our sun. Um, and it's how most helium is created post Big Bang. You have protons colliding with each other at incredible speeds. You need high densities and high temperatures to get this thing to really drive. It's a three-step process by which you slowly add pieces to the nucleus until you end up with a helium atom. Now, in terms of energy um, mass equivalence here, we look at the helium, which is the byproduct, and we look at what goes in, the four protons, and they do not have the same masses. The helium is a little less massive. When you use E equals mc squared on this, we get, with the mass difference, a energy release of point. 4, 3 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. That's about 4 trillionths of a joule. Not a lot, right? But the luminosity of our sun is 4 times 10 to 26 watts. That's joules per second. So when you divide these numbers, we get 10 to the 38 reactions per second taking place. And that having that many reactions occur, this many proton per chain reactions occur, is consistent with the luminosity of the sun. Now, when you look at this, you may be you may you know find this a little incredulous. I mean, ten to the thirty eight reactions is a ridiculously large number. Um, but one of the things that comes out of this are these neutrinos, very small subatomic particles. In fact, they're so small, we know they have mass. We just have not been able to measure it yet because it's so small. But anyway, these things come flying out of the sun, two of them per reaction, and guess what? We can count them. And the counts do match up with the 10 to the 38. So we do know this is the process taking place inside the sun. Wild stuff. All right, last example here, and then we will wrap this up. Um, we want to just get a sense of how much energy is this arrest energy. 
So uh, the U.S., I don't know how old this number is, but at some point, at least recently, the U.S. uses approximately 1 times 10 to the 20 joules of energy per year. Now, say, for example, uh, aliens come down and they give us all their energy uh, production technologies and we have some futuristic antimatter reactor that can convert rest energy purely into, into uh, usable energy. Uh, we would like to know how much mass of matter and antimatter fuel would need to be consumed yearly um, to match this energy here. So we're going to assume that this fuel has the density of iron, which is 7 times 7.86 grams per cubic centimeter, and we're stacked into bricks to form a cubical pile. How high would it be? Well, first let's take this energy here and convert it into a mass. So this amount of uh, energy uh, is equivalent to basically 1.11 times 10 to the 3 kilograms of rest mass, of rest mass. So what we can do here is take our density and turn that into a volume. So the density is mass over volume. That's what we're talking about, a cube here. So it's going to be mass over side cubed. Solve for A, put our numbers in there. And we end up with a value of 52 centimeters. So if we had a iron cube that measured 52 centimeters on its sides, that has the rest energy um, required to fuel the United States for a year. Now, if it's going to be antimatter and matter, you, you might want to have a cube of, you know, you'd have to break that mass in half. You could do that. Break the mass in half, have one matter, have one antimatter, and then... I don't know. It's a futuristic reactor. Who knows how it works, right? But anyway, um, if we have the means to convert rest mass purely into energy, it doesn't take that much matter, actually. It's crazy, but it doesn't take that much matter. Of course, you learn thermo, so it's not that simple. All right. I think that takes us to the end here. So thanks for watching. Hope you liked relativity. We've got quantum coming up soon. It's going to get exciting.